On behalf of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Administration for Community Living, and the Indian Health Service, I would like to welcome everyone to the Long-Term Services and Supports webinar series. My name is Joanna Case, and I work for Kaufman & Associates. I'll be providing technical support throughout the webinar. Today's webinar is Money Follows the Person, Tribal Initiative, Part 3. Before we begin, I'd like to highlight the main features of your Zoom webinar interface. First, the presentation slides are the main window, and the speakers will appear at the top just above the presentation. At the bottom of your screen is the Zoom menu bar. Here you will find the Q&A box. We encourage you to use this feature to submit any questions at any point during the webinar. We will leave time for a QA segment to address all questions. At the bottom of your menu bar, you will also find a chat box. Please use the chat box to report any, any technical issues you may be experiencing. We will respond to those concerns as they come in. Another menu option is the raised hand icon. Please use this feature when you, when you would like for us to unmute your line to ask a question aloud during the QA segment. Additionally, live captioning is available during today's broadcast. Simply click the closed caption icon, says CC, from your bottom menu bar to use this feature. Finally, please be aware that today's webinar is being recorded and that the recording will be made available online in the near future on CMS.gov. If you would like a copy of the slides sent to you directly, please email ltssinfo at kaufmaninc.com. With those announcements made, I would like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Please note this webinar series is supported by a contract awarded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent the official position or policies of the Department of Health and Human Services or the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Russell Coker will be our facilitator today. Russell is the Money Follows the Person Tribal Initiative Director for the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority. Thank you all for joining us today. And I'll go ahead and transition to Russell to introduce today's topic. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to the uh, third installment of the MFP Tribal Initiative. Um, Joanne, I, I just want to give you a heads up that I, I lost contact again, so uh, I'm trying to re-log in, just to give you a heads up, but uh, hopefully you can hear me. So um, I am being heard, right? We can hear you, Russell. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, again, welcome to the uh, to the webinar. Uh, a little bit about me. As Joanne mentioned, I am the MFPTI uh, Director for the Oklahoma Healthcare Authority, the uh, state Medicaid agency in Oklahoma. I'm also a full-blooded member of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. Um, my community is located about uh, about an hour, hour and a half east of Oklahoma City. Uh, prior to be, prior to coming to um, the Medicaid agency, I did some um, adjunct teaching at uh, Oklahoma State University, the uh, the other school here in Oklahoma, uh, and I also had a chance to work with uh, Native American youth at a uh, uh, American Indian organization called UNITY, which stands for United National Indian Tribal Youth, which was based here in Oklahoma. So uh, where I served as uh, the health education director. So uh, you may have heard me mention that I, I lost contact. Well, there's a reason for that. And that's because uh, for those of you who don't know, we're uh, here in Oklahoma, we're in the midst of a, of a very, very nasty ice storm. Um, the, the agency building in Oklahoma City has no power. So we're all uh, relegated to working from home today. Uh, I have no power. I've been without power since Sunday, Sunday night. So um, we, we've been busy checking on family members and elders, so making sure that they have you know heat, food, and water. So um, in addition to that, it's all in the midst of uh, COVID, which only adds uh, adds to the situation. So uh, I hope the weather's better wherever you are. And speaking of which, um, although I can't see it right now. Uh, I would like to ask before we get started if if uh, if you can locate the chat box um, uh, on your screen, and if you would uh, enter would out of curiosity, just wanted to see where you're from, maybe a city and state, and if you're a member of a uh, 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 tribal nation to uh, to add that to to so 
uh, your your city and state, and and uh, if you're a member of a tribal nation, to put your tribe in the chat box uh, also. So, if you will do that, just want to see uh, see see what kind of audience we have this uh, this afternoon. Joy and I assume they're coming in. Is that yes, they are. So I'll give okay. you a few of them. We have a lot sure. of folks. Um, let's see. Claremore, Oklahoma, Cherokee. Oh, okay. Conway, South Carolina, Shoshone Bannock. Um, Chehalis, Washington, Cherokee. Minneapolis, Minnesota. Let's see. Bellingham, Kalispell, Montana. We have someone from two folks from Maine. Uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, Baltimore, Boston. Iowa, let's see, a lot of folks responding. Cherokee from North Carolina, Woodworth, Louisiana. <laughs> Thanks everyone for responding. And Russell, you're on mute, so we're not hearing you. Okay, how about now? Yes, we're hearing you now. Okay, next slide. Okay, so the MFP Tribal Initiative came about in uh, 2014 and was, uh, was an offshoot of the uh, traditional MFP program. Um, funding was approved by CMS in 2014, and five states, uh, let's see, Oklahoma, Washington State, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Wisconsin are currently uh, working within the MFPTI, and uh, out of the five states, we are working with 31 tribal nations and coordinating across several level, levels of government, including tribal, state, federal, city, and urban. Next slide. So early on in, in the initiative, uh, the, the, the five states got together and decided that it was uh, it, it would be a good thing if all the all five states got together and uh, uh, approached this initiative uh, uh, in a group in a group fashion, which uh, has really helped not only myself but the other four states. I think I can speak for them. Uh, so we came up with uh, some overall an, an overall goal, which is to establish sustainable and culturally appropriate long term services and supports in tribal communities. Next slide. We also came up with a few pr principles to uh, guide us in, in the work that we do with our, with our uh, tribal nations uh, within the five states. Uh, and those include promote government to government relations, enhance tribal infrastructure, increase access to needed services, address disparities, design and implement effective programs, and maximize fiscal resources. Next. So as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the five states who are participating in, in the MFPTI, uh, we will uh, have those listed. And, and uh, here's some of the tribes that we are working with within uh, the, the respective states. Uh, we'll begin with Minnesota. Next slide. North Dakota. Oklahoma, Washington State, Washington State continued, and finally, Wisconsin. So a quick uh, map of uh, where we are located, of course, you see uh, the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma here in Oklahoma uh, in the Midwest. And then we have the uh, uh, Menominee Nation um, in Upper Wisconsin. Next. So with that, we will go into the uh, uh, MFP tri Tribal Initiative panel discussion um, and also want to uh, I want to remind everyone that if you have any questions throughout the webinar, to please enter them in the chat box. And as Joanna mentioned, they will be addressed at the end of the webinar. So um, 
Next slide. So our very honored to have our, our first guest uh, from the Menominee uh, Nation in Wisconsin, uh, Erica. Um, so Erica, if you can uh, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about your tribe and uh, some of the work that you do there. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Erica Kolakowski, and I'm the Director of Aging and Long-Term Care for the Menominee Indian Tribe, and I've been in my position for a little over a year. The word Menominee was derived from the Ojibwe language, meaning wild rice people. There are over 8,000 tribal members, and a quarter of them are over the age of 55. Our reservation is located in a very rural wooded area in central Wisconsin. We have over 350 square miles of heavily wooded land. It is the largest tract of virgin timber in the whole state of Wisconsin. Some of our residents' homes are only reachable via these logging trails. With being so wooded and it contributes to the lack of cell phone coverage and Wi-Fi access, this makes it difficult for communication and access to information and services, especially mm -hmm. during this time of pandemic. Our aging division consists of a 12 resident assisted living facility, an elder benefit specialist, a dementia care specialist, elder support providers, a caregiver program, two senior meal sites that serve over 200 meals per day, and then our long-term care program, which we are here to talk about today. Very good, thank you, Erica. Don. Hello, my name is Don Claser, and I'm the program manager for the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin. I've worked with the tribe since 2015 to develop and implement the long-term care program. Our mission is to respect and honor the traditions of our members by providing services that promote independent living and enhance the quality of life. Our program values individual choice, optimum health, compassion, and integrity. We seek to ensure that each member is treated with respect and that services are individualized to empower member self-worth. In 2018, the Menominee Indian Tribe entered into a three-party agreement with DHS and the MCO. The three-party agreement enables the Menominee Indian Tribe's long-term care department to deliver case management services to enrolled members who reside on the Menominee Indian Reservation. The three-party agreement from DHS outlines our standards of operations in which we follow. Um, and I just wanna say thank you for inviting us here today. Thank you, Don. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll begin with uh, some, some questions. And, and of course, I remind everyone that if you have any, uh, uh, any questions, please add them to the, to the chat box. But uh, I'd like to ask both of you, um, what has been, in your opinion, what has, what's been the biggest success of your program so far? Sure. It would definitely be how our program has grown. Um, it shows that we are successful in integrating the importance of culture in how we deliver our services. Um, there are over 120 support caregivers um, in our community that are, in many cases, family members and are employed to take care of their loved ones because of our long-term care program. We also integrate cultural competence in our hiring process of our case managers. Our preference is always to hire within the tribe first. And we start by identifying the knowledge and skills of the qualified candidate. DHS establishes the basic requirements for case managers and RN case managers for the new hires. They must possess either a bachelor's degree in social work, human services, psychology uh, related field, and then three years of experience working in one of the family care target populations. Otherwise be a registered nurse and hold a current license to practice the state of Wisconsin or practice in the state of Wisconsin um, and a bachelor's degree is preferred. Um, then have two years of 
of skilled nursing experience and preferably in gerontology, disabilities, or in home care. We partnered with many entities throughout the tribe. <clears throat> we worked with the UW Extension to provide culturally sensitive training sessions for our staff. We received assistance from tribal members employed by UW Extension to, pre to present various topics about the history and the culture of the Menominee Indian tribe to our staff. The training covered topics such as cross-cultural communication and culturally sensitive business etiquette. This experience helped employees understand the culture, the customs, traditions, and history of the tribe, which is necessary to work effectively with its members. In addition, a drug force detective from the Manami Tribal Police Department met with our staff to provide education on the safety while working in the community and discuss the community-wide drug issues and sex trafficking. We continue to hold these trainings as needed. The relationships that we build with our members are our greatest reward. Trust and respect is at the heart of being able to provide an exceptional care for all of our members. Thank you, Erica. Don, anything to add? No, I don't have anything to add. Okay, thank you. Okay, Erica, you mentioned uh, uh, one of the one of the intriguing aspects of this of this initiative to me as a tribal member was the um, uh, was a chance to include um, you know culturally appropriate services and uh, you know culturally competent um, uh, trainings that you had, but can you speak a little bit more on that? I mean, what, what, is, what did that entail to say a, a non-tribal member who was trying to work with your tribal members? For those um, people that are coming from the outside, um, they're learning the, the culture and aspects of the history of what the Native Americans went through. Um, everything from termination, um, the boarding schools, things like that, so that they have empathy and see where historically they are coming from and, and how to work sympathetically with the situations or the result from those happenings. Thank you, Erica. Uh, I know we talked about the uh, successes that you had, but uh, uh, like, like any new program, uh, I'm sure you had some challenges and some uh, 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 you know, well challenges in setting up your program. Could you could you discuss that a little bit and how you overcame those? Sure. Um, we had m discovered many challenges as we developed this program. Um, everything from funding for adult family homes, financing software systems developing policies and procedures and having adequate office space, recruiting and hiring employees, retaining staff and building internal systems and processes for the success of the program. Tribal administration of the tribe um, expressed that the long-term care program needed to be self-sustaining monitoring staff's billable time and creating work efficiencies in our processes to improve in this area was critical to sustain our program. All activities that could be tied back to the care of a specific member is allowed to be billed back to Medicaid. Prior to partnering with the MCO, the tribe did not have established case management software systems. Our team used Microsoft Word for documentation and printed hard copies for filing. This made it very difficult to monitor work. All information was stored in hard files. And today we're able to use that MCO's software system. This gives us great accessibility, organization, and the ability to do audits in a timely manner and very accurately. Um, a huge benefit is that the Menominee Long-Term Care Program did not have to fund this cost separately because there are big price tags with those. Um, prior to the partnership with the MCO, the tribe did not have an established policies or procedures for the long-term care program. Developing these or procedures and policies and 
securing DHS approval proved to be an insurmountable task for our small organization. With the partnership of the MCO, we had access to all of the MCO's policies and procedures and DHS had already approved those in which we were able to enable us to meet the long-term care members' needs. 2016, the Menominee Tribe received a grant from the Shakopee Tribe, which enabled us to build a facility to house our long-term care department. After three years, the growth of long-term care membership and the staff, um, we have outgrown that area to like the current facility, <laughs> specifically in the meeting and the training rooms. Like many businesses, recruiting and retaining employees has proven to be a continuous struggle. One of the main reasons for having difficulty retaining staff is related to the continued changes as we develop our program. The long-term care staff have participated in five major transitions during this time period. Um, the first was transferring all of the long-term care cases from the Menominee County to the tribal oversight. Partnering, the second would be partnering with the MCO and having to complete the enrollment process, assuring that all members meet the financial and the physical qualifications of the program. The third would be completing the intensive training that Lakeland um, had to be evaluated by DHS for site readiness and approval to administer case management for our program. The fourth transition would be training staff to utilize the MCO software system, which was MIDAS, which then transitioned to a different program 14 months later. Training staff to utilize the True Care system began in October 2019. And most recently, the staff were scheduled to participate in the upgrade version of the True Care system, which started in October of this year. As in many departments, um, change at any type can create frustration, anxiety, and team support is the key to prevent that turnover. Um, we are in the process of developing a training and support position for our long-term care program because due to the shortage of our staff, um, we've been unable to fully implement this position, but the position is valuable in the growth and the and for the staff in retaining our employees. Thank you, Erica. Um, something that's, um, uh, I think it's affected all tribes and all tribal communities, um, and that's COVID, especially with you, Erica. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about uh, how COVID has affected uh, maybe your programs and services, and also about how it has affected your tribe and how your tribe is uh, dealing with the effects of uh, COVID? John, would you like to take this one? Sure. Do you want to first talk about um, the tribe and then I can talk about the program? Okay, sure. Um, so the tribe has instituted an incident command, which I have been a part of since March. Um, we're taking a very conservative approach on all of the steps in keeping our community safe. Um, we meet, initially we had been meeting every day. Um, now we meet twice a week and um, we take all of the guidelines and specifications from the CDC and our health department. And we work very closely with our Menominee Tribal Clinic in, in creating guidelines and um, issuing guidance and getting the communications out to all of the community members. We actually use our meal sites as a distribution center for communication. So any new ordinances or um, warnings coming from incident command are printed and put in every single meal on a daily basis to go out into the community so that those people that do not have um, access to a computer or you know uh, phone lines wi-fi um, have it in paper form okay 
And so I'll speak specifically for the long-term care program. So um, health and safety remain top priority for the members, our staff and the community. Our goal is to adhere to the DHS contract guidelines with contacts, assessments, functional screens and care plan reviews. Um, currently we have um, modifications to how we conduct our functional screens, um, contacts and assessments. Our goal is to minimize COVID exposure and transmission while ensuring health and safety and the delivery of care to our members. A key part of the success is that we recognize the importance of keeping staff safe during the pandemic so that we can continue to be an integral part in providing needed services for our members. So the Menominee long-term care team is making limited in-person visits right now. Um, and they are increasing the number of phone contacts that they make to our members. So they're reaching out to them at least twice um, a month to check in and see how things are going. Um, despite all of the challenges with COVID, every aspect of the team's daily duties have remained remarkable consist remarkably consistent. IDT TAP are completing um, all of their um, functions of their jobs while working from home. Uh, to date, staff have remained in compliance with their assessments, their MCPs, and their contacts. They are working daily with outside agencies to establish services, plan for hospital or nursing home admits and discharges, um, doing admits for CBRFs or adult family homes. They uh, are completing um, assessments and approving uh, therapy services, which might be physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech. They assist in monitoring care provided to members from outside facilities, um, reviewing the positive behavior support plans, and making sure that members are receiving quality care, adequate uh, activities, and nutritional meals and staff coordinate and approve transportation for dialysis and wound care. Um, they continue to coordinate for any home modifications that might need to be done. Bathroom mods are, are building ramps on homes um, and uh, approving services for home delivered meals or lawn mowing and snow plowing. Um, teams uh, um, continue to utilize Skype for business and Zoom so they can conduct all of their assessments um, online. And um, like I said, health and faith, safety remain the top priority for our members, the IDT and the community. Thank you, Don. Uh, I'd like to go back now to the first of uh, when you were building your programs and your services. Um, I'd like to ask what kind of support did you get from the uh, community and also the uh, uh, I guess the tribal council, maybe what kind of support did they give you when you were building your programs and services and how did you uh, garner their support? Okay, so, um, so we work with tribal clinic for our FQHC reporting. Um, we've also been supported by tribal administration for the development of our program. Uh, we're able to reach out to them at any time if we have any questions or concerns. DHS has been incredibly supportive. Um, we have monthly meetings with them um, and those meetings are between DHS, us and the MCO to discuss any program updates or any concerns that we might have. Um, in addition, I have a weekly meeting set up with DHS to again, review any um, member concerns or program concerns. The, and then uh, another huge success, I think, uh, for the support that we receive from the MCO is that they've developed a business plan for us. And with that business plan, we have access to um, all of their um, departments and services within their departments. So we would have access to, if we needed training for staff, the MCO will work with us to provide that training. Um, any questions on uh, abuse and neglect 
any critical incidents. All of those things we're able to work with the MCO staff. And this has been very helpful. All right, thank you. Erica, anything to add? Nope. Okay, next question. Um, uh, you, you mentioned working with MCOs and, and you're also having to work with uh, local, um, even state and federal federal partners in, in the work that you do. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that and what that's been like in, in, in you know, getting the support and, and working with, um, I guess, entities who may have never worked with tribal nations before? What was that like? Sure. Um, we have had tremendous amount of support from DHS and the MCO Lakeland Care. Um, I truly believe that they have our program's best interest at heart and want the, to see the Menominee long-term care program succeed. We have had continuous support and at any follow-up from both DHS and the MCO. And we feel very comfortable bringing any cultural differences, concerns, or questions to the table for discussion. There are many situations that are unique to the culture of the reservation and are not encountered so readily by outside programs. Um, these relationships have been so critical to the success of our Menominee long-term care program. Thank you, Erica. So you mentioned some of the, uh, you had um, mentioned some of the programs and services that you have uh, in place now, but I'd like to ask you, um, what is your programs looking for like in the future? Are you, are you looking to expand services? Are you wanting to add new services or can you give us an idea of what uh, your program is wanting to do in the future? Of course, our, our goal would be to expand services as long as there's a need. Um, we've found definitely that there are great needs within the community. And so we will continue to meet that need and, and add staff to be able to be successful with them. Don, anything to ask, add? Um, yes, our goal is to expand our program. So um, like Erica said before, we're hoping to um, build a, a training department within um, house and and it would be my goal to um, hopefully branch out and um, be able to support more people with our program. Thank you. So within the past year, um, have you seen an increase in tribal members applying for or using your services? And if so, what do you think is the reason for that? So we have seen an increase in the number of people that are enrolling on our program. Um, to date, we have served 196 uh, members. And I believe that um, our members are talking to their family and friends and letting know um, just what kind of support that they get from our, our program. And in addition to that, the um, tribal clinic has been referring some members uh, to our program as well. Thank you, Don. So you mentioned uh, having uh, working with um, uh, you know various levels of, uh, of entities and, and getting your program set up, but. Um, were, were there any particular issues or, or challenges in, in working with uh, uh, these entities and, and getting you know. Uh, I guess getting them on board with what you were trying to do, and if uh, I, I guess any advice you could give to uh, to those who are looking to, you know, work with AAA's, uh, you know, MCOs, uh, federal and state uh, entities. So I think we've had a wonderful partnership with the MCO. They've been very supportive. Um, you know, any concerns that we have, we're always able to take those to the table and sit down and have a conversation and work through those. So I, I guess, um, you know, my recommendation is to, you know, always be open and honest and make sure that you have those conversations so that you can work through that. You know, one of the things that Erica had said in the beginning, you know, funding was, um, very worrisome for us, you know, how are we going to take care of our members and, and 
um, one of the greatest costs that we had were some of our members who were residing in adult family homes. And those costs were anywhere from $10,000 to $30,000 a month. And when we were first start, our, yes, a month. So when we were first starting out, we were unsure, you know, how were we going to work through that? And after many conversations of sitting with the MCO, um, you know, we're still able to keep all of our members who are in those facilities are still there receiving excellent care. And we didn't have to move them and put them somewhere where their needs may not have been met. So just having those conversations and, and um, you know, keeping the communication open. Thank you, Don. Erica, anything to add? No? Okay. So, um, in our line of work and, and, and mine also, um, I, I, I come across um, people who have never worked with tribal nations before, uh, and, and most of them are asking for um, some advice or some direction uh, in doing so in working with a tribal nation. Um, is there anything that you can share with, with, with us that uh, maybe you've experienced or you, you've had uh, experience in working with um, you know, outside entities? You know, I think everybody has been willing to learn and listen. Um, so our experience overall, our experience has been very positive. Working with DHS and working with the MCO, uh, you know, I just don't think we could have um, partnered with a better MCO. So it has worked very well for our members and for our staff. Okay. All right, thanks. And, um, Last question is this is um, um, and if you had questions. So if you had a magic wand and could uh, change anything you wanted to improve services for your people, uh, what would it be and why? If I had a magic wand, I think I would hope for funding for the members to help um, with the big home repairs that aren't covered by the program. Um, the list would include like roofs and furnaces, windows, mold remediation, um, septic systems, wells, chimney repairs, appliances, water heaters, things like that. I would hope that for the ability to build an internal training process to improve staff support and employee retention for the continuity of member care. And I would hope for funding and services for um, the physically disabled members who often don't qualify for funding or programs because they are under the age of 55. Um, I would hope for treatment centers in our area for members who are physically disabled um, and that adult family homes could be built on the reservation to bring the members back to the reservation for their services. Um, these things are so important to the respect and the health and safety of our members. Thank you, Erica. Don, anything to add? I don't have anything. Okay, all right. Okay, so that is the last question I had, Joanna. So I don't know if there's any um, questions in the chat box yet, but I will turn this uh, back over to you. First of all, thanks to uh, thanks to Don and Erica for for being with us today, and I will turn this back over to Joanna. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Real quick, real quick. Okay, can you bring that last slide up? Uh, I'll go back. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, there, the, the five states uh, who are working with, uh, what, 31 states, uh, keep in mind that there are over 570 plus uh, recognized uh, uh, tribal nations in 35 states, um, each with unique customs, traditions, culture, and, and history. So, uh, we're hoping that the five states who are participating in this MFPTI uh, can serve as a resource for you. And uh, next, next page, Joanne. Uh, so we're hoping that some of the work that we've done with um, with our tribes can be replicated, um, or or even if you need some assistance or some direction in anything that uh, you're looking to do within uh, within your tribal nation. So uh, here are the, the the state contacts for all of the um, MAPTI states, uh, and 
Minnesota, North Dakota, Wisconsin, Oklahoma, and, and Washington. So uh, if you need any uh, advice, if you need any uh, clarification, if you have any questions that you would like to ask any of us, uh, please feel free to do so. I know each of these people personally, and they all the, they are the best uh, uh, the best friends I, I've ever made. So uh, they will happily answer all of your questions. So um, next slide. So Madol, that's how we say thank you in Seminole, and uh, I will turn this back over to uh, Joanna. Thank you, Russell. So this is our time for questions. Please any, enter any questions you have into the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. And you could also use the chat box if you'd like. We do have a question that was prior, was entered prior. And this first question is, are HCBS targeted towards people with intellectual and developmental disabilities being requested, offered, and or used? We do provide services to IDN DD members. Okay, great. Did you have anything else to add, Erica? Okay, great. So that is the only question we have. So we can go ahead and wrap that portion up. And um, I would just like to thank. Joanna, I think we had. We had a question come in there. Oh, did we? Oh, I sure see it. Thank you, Russell. Yeah. Um, okay, the question is, has it been more difficult to engage members in a culturally appropriate way over the phone or via Zoom during the pandemic? Um, definitely via Zoom because of the technical difficulties. Um, just the the Wi-Fi capability currently on the reservation is very haphazard. Um, and so we've tried advertising things through Zoom and has had very limited participation. Um, that's why we really focus on calling our members, um, calling our community members, doing welfare checks over the phone, making sure they have everything they need. Um, things like that. Great. Dawn, anything else to add for that? Sometimes it, it has been difficult to reach people by, um, reach our members by telephone as well. And again, because of the rural areas and we just have um, a lot of challenges with that. So throughout the pandemic, we have had to rely on our police department when we were not able to you know, contact our members and ask that they do a welfare check. And everybody has worked together well just to assure the safety of everyone in the community. Mm -hmm. Many of our members have the rechargeable phone cards for their phones. And once those cards expire, um, you know, they don't, their phone doesn't work any longer or they switch numbers completely. And so our, our program definitely struggles with that. Thank you both. The next question is to Russell and the panelists. Where do you see the MFPTI going in upcoming years? Will it continue? Uh, good question. Uh, this is Russell. Good question. Um, in guidance from CMS, um, at this point, uh, funding is always an issue, and it has been uh, throughout the whole uh, process of the MFPTI. So um, without being able to um, uh, say anything officially um, at this point. Um, we're not sure. We're not sure about future funding. Uh, we, we do know that uh, we're, we're, we might be able to uh, uh, provide, uh, well, we, we might be able to give, be given funding um, uh, through our, through the regular MFP program. But um, again, there's, there's, um, you know, there's nothing official that I can say about that. So um, I, I just rather leave it at that. Thank you, Russell. I do see one question that came in in the Q&A box. The question is, are all panelists open to community partnerships for other programs where outreach is critically needed for native tribal communities? Don't 
John or Erica, would you like to take that? Um, I think our department strives to work together with as many other entities within the tribe as we can and outside of the tribe. Um, we have MOUs and um, agreements and just kind of just that umbrella approach that we're in this together and we can get as much done as we can together. Thank you. And did you want to add to that, Dawn, or was that good? Great. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions. I'll give just a couple more seconds in case there's any last minute. I don't see anything else in the Q&A box or the chat. So I will go ahead and thank Russell, Erica, Dawn. Thank you all for joining us today and for sharing information about MFPTI and how it supports communities in Indian country. In closing, I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar was recorded and that the audio and presentation slides will be made available online at cms.gov on the Tribal LTSS Technical Assistance Center website. Thank you again for joining today's webinar. Our session is now concluded. Thanks everyone.